I want you to take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke in the sixth chapter, Luke chapter number six, and we're going to read only one verse. I'm going to start with that verse, and I'll finish uh, with that verse, and I don't want you to mistake what I'm about to say as an apology, because it's not an apology. Um, I am not a prophet. I, I don't. Uh, I don't really flourish in the role of a prophet. I have some friends of mine, preacher friends of mine, that are prophets. And uh, I, I'm grateful for their ministry. But there comes times when a pastor has to step into that role as a prophet from time. But now, understand, it's not my sweet spot. And uh, I, I'm, I'm here today to kind of be in that role with you on July the 4th weekend to kind of talk to us a few minutes uh, about where we are as a country and uh, what I see uh, happening here in this nation and uh, maybe some encouragement along the way, but mainly to kind of point out some things that if we're not careful, we have a tendency to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear toward. Uh, this passage, the Lord Jesus makes it very, very clear uh, verse 46 says, why, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now we call ourselves a Christian nation, don't we? And yet at the same time, God says, why do you do that? And you don't do what I tell you to do. Why do we do that individually? Why do we say that Jesus is our Lord and yet we don't follow his commands? Uh, I've watched and I know that you've watched in these last 40 years, particularly maybe the last 20 years, as there has been a mounting, growing, aggressive attempt to remove any vestige of anything that is sacred and holy and godly out of our culture. 1962, we eliminated prayer out of the school system. If you go do any kind of studies, you're going to discover that the next 10 years following that decision, crime accelerated at an unprecedented rate. Teenage pregnancy became an epidemic uh, in our country. I remember when I was uh, going to Slater Marietta High School in the mid-1960s, Mrs. Vermillion was my homeroom teacher and I'd go into that class every, every, every day and she had an old worn, tattered King James Bible sitting uh, on her desk. And every day she would open up that scripture and she would read the scripture to us. And then she would lead us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Give us a devotion. Every day we miss that. Our founding fathers established this country they were men of faith. And we've seen a nation now that is moving away from its moorings, moving away from its spiritual foundations that has held this country together all of these years. How long has it been since you have seen a nativity scene uh, at any kind of government institution? Just a couple of years ago, there was a young lady who had a 4.7 GPA. I can't even compute that, but had a 4.7 GPA. She was the valedictorian of her class. She stood before her class, and in the middle of her speech, the microphone was cut off uh, because it was deemed that she was being proselyting, and they refused to allow her to be heard. There's lawsuits uh, by the scores right now um, in our court system uh, that has been launched by somebody that has been offended at someone else's prayer time. We've watched in God our, uh, that we trust that's listed on our dollar, on our coinage and, and, and we have this major attempt to get that off of our monetary system to the point, well, we are just riding on the edge of our coins. We're moving Sadly, sadly, we are moving in a day where the heat is being turned up. There was a day not long ago, and it hadn't been but a few years ago, when that which was uh, godly and that which was spiritual, when people wanted or offered up spiritual input, it was just ignored. But no longer is it being ignored. 
As a matter of fact, there is a government that is, or a culture, let me put it that way, there is a culture that is surrounding us that is becoming more and more anti-Christian right before our very eyes. You know, I'm grateful for what uh, our uh, president has been able to accomplish in a year and a half or two years. It's, it's really good that more people are working than ever before. It's very good that our economy is flourishing. It's a lot of, a lot of good things that are going on. But let, let me just say a word to you here this morning. You know, it really doesn't matter if everybody has a job. It, it really doesn't matter if the... Um, economy is booming greater than it's ever before in the history of this nation. You understand the greatest need in our country is not people going to work and not our economy flourishing. The greatest need in our country is for the hearts of people to be turned toward Christ. We used to sing God Bless America, and I love that song, and I, I want to continue to sing that song, but I'm wondering if we don't need to change a word or two in there and say God save America because desperate need of revival is now. And until America prostrates itself before a holy God and cries out to God in desperation that we begin to put back into place Christian principles that this nation was founded on. I, I want to let you know that we're people of the book. We're people of the Bible. We are people of God. We are people of the Spirit, and we are people that has an agenda. Jesus uh, has infiltrated his word by saying, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now, it is true that our, our Christian principles are under an attack. It is true that we are under an assault. But I'm grateful that God has given to us a promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Now, you, you understand, uh, we win. <laughs> I've read the last book. But until then, There's going to be pressure. There's going to be a falling away. There's going to be apostasy. Now I want to take a few minutes this morning, again, stepping outside my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, I, I want to give you three parallels to what I see uh, that exist with the church and with America. It, it's kind of... Uh, Amazing when you get to thinking about it. The first parallel that I want you to see is that you and I are involved in freedom, both in America and in the church. When, when the signers of the Declaration of Independence to separate from foreign bondage, they did it with a price. The declaration that they would no longer in America uh, be under the tyranny of some foreign domination that from that moment on, America would become a free and a sovereign nation. You know, Christians basically, Christians basically said the same thing when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says you will know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. The Bible says in Galatians 5 and 1, for freedom we have been set free. Jesus came to set the captives free. He, he sets us free from sin. He sets us free from death. He sets us free from hell. He sets us free from the judgment by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's that parallel that exists that both involve freedom. Second, I want you to see with me this morning is that both are involved with unity. Both speak of unity. The dream of our founding fathers was this, that we could exist together with all kinds of diverse opinions in America. Eventually, that we would become colonized, that ultimately, 
uh, we would wind up in statehood. And they made sure that e pluribus unum existed. Many, yet one, stamped on our coinage. Many kinds of people, yet one. All kinds of states, but yet we are one. So that when our freedom is threatened, what matters more than anything else at that moment is that we are one nation under God. We are not Carolinians at that moment. We're not Virginians. We're not Georgians. We're not Tennesseans. We are Americans when we are threatened. When these great men of God sitting before me, these I thank you men for your involvement today, the veterans of foreign wars. I'm grateful we have a 94-year-old sitting right down here uh, with us this morning as well. When our soldiers went to Desert Storm, when they fought in Iraq, when they fought in Afghanistan, when they get over there, they didn't raise a flag from North Carolina. They raised a flag of their country because there is unity. Now, you and I have watched the multiplication of denominationalism. Let's talk about the church just a minute and how that parallels with the nation. When Martin Luther signed the 95 Thesis on the door, things began to change and denominations started springing up all over the world. And we have seen the multiplication of denominations that have become so prevalent. We watch as the Methodists raised their flag and the Presbyterians raised their flag and we watched as the Nazarenes raised their flag and the Assemblies of God and Southern Baptists would raise their flags. But the fact of the matter is when we begin to be threatened, when our privileges to serve God begin to be threatened, when our freedom to worship gets threatened, all of a sudden it's e pluribus unum. That, that denominationalism begins to take a second seat and there is unity that is involved. I went to Washington, D.C. just a few weeks ago and, and we gathered in Great Assembly Hall and I looked across that uh, great hall of people and there were people from every walk of faith under the banner of Calvary that you could ever imagine. And I lit, watched his hands were lifted up and praise being offered unto God. And, and, and we worshiped together and we sat and we listened to the challenges and to the charges and to the alarms that were being sounded. And nobody thought, well, I'm gonna raise the flag of Baptist or I'm gonna raise the flag of Presbyterian or Methodist. We were one in Christ and that was the prayer of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 17 when he lifted up his voice unto his father and he said, oh God, that they could be one as you and I are one. I'm glad to be a Southern Baptist. I, I wave the banner of Southern Baptist, but more than anything, I'm glad to be under the banner of the cross. I have confidence in God's people that when we're threatened, it's e pluribus unum that takes place. Let me give you the third, if I could. When I hear of uh, the parallel between the church and our country, it not only speaks of freedom and unity, both speak of responsibility and sacrifice. It is interesting that on July the 4th, 1776, those 56 who signed that Emancipation Proclamation, 24 of them were lawyers, 11 of them were merchants, uh, nine of them were plantation owners, and the rest of them were just a menagerie, if you will. When they signed that Emancipation Proclamation, they knew that they weren't being politically correct And they knew that leaving their name on that document, they were not being politically correct. They were challenged time and time again. Remove your name, take your name off. But they never did. They stood firm. They did not acquiesce. They did not fold. They all resisted, nine of them 
died during the revolution. Five of them were captured and executed by the British government. Twelve of them lost their families as they were burned to the ground. They, they didn't fold under the pressure. They stood their ground even at the cost of their life and the families, uh, their lives of their families. They, they were believed with all of their heart that they were on the right course and they would not be turned. I look across our auditorium today, and, and by the way, I saw stuff today I never dreamed that I would see. It was amazing, scared me to death the first time. I thought, wow. You, you know, and it's all decorated up. It's beautiful. I thank God for the reminder today because we are remembering those this morning who gave their lives at Normandy and Korea and Vietnam and Guadalcanal, in Iraq and Afghanistan who shed their blood uh, to keep me and you free. I, I think of the men and women in Desert Storm. Why did they do that? Why did they give that ultimate sacrifice? Because they believe that freedom is costly to gain and it's costly to keep. Now in contrast to that, with the church and the people of the church, may I say to all of us in this room, it brings much responsibility to us and could call on much sacrifice. Now, the fact of the matter is there are not many in this room. Now I know that there are some, but there are not many in this room that you have ever been called on to sacrifice for your faith. But hang on. In my humble but accurate opinion, it is coming. It is coming. Stephen was the first martyr of the church and since then there have been multitudes that have been tarred and burned at the stake. There have been multitudes that have been sown inside the skins of animals and thrown to the lions. There have been millions that have stood before firing squads and given their life. Many have been scalped and their eyes have been plucked out. But yet they did not fall, they did not fail, they stood their ground and they stood the test and no wonder that the phrase is so real that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I want you to take your Bible, look with me to Hebrews chapter 11 for just a minute. Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to begin reading with me in verse 35. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Who's he talking about in this passage? These are the early believers who paid the price, who went the distance, who carried out that which was required, who realized that being a Christian was a whole lot more than sitting in a soft theater seat in an air-conditioned building once a month. They laid down their life in a very hostile culture. The Apostle Paul experienced the same thing. Look back a few pages to 2 Corinthians and chapter number 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I suffered shipwreck a day and a night. I've been in the deep and journeys often, perils in waters, perils of robbers, 
perils of mine own countrymen, perils by heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, and weariness, painfulness, watchings, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, and nakedness. And if that weren't enough, God laid the responsibility of the churches on me as well. He paid the price. He went the distance. Now when we see this, and I believe it is this, when we are watching and seeing and observing this anti-Christian movement in a country, it's unprecedented pace, the founding of this country. It's not, hear me, it is not abnormal. It's been happening since the beginning of the first church. It's what God said was going to happen. Look at 1 Peter, if you will, for just a minute. 1 Peter chapter number 4, beginning in verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And on their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he's glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Folks, that's what we need to be reminded of. We didn't get into some kind of sleazy grace. We are born into the family of God to stand firm. May I say to you, that's not something in the distant future. It is right now. There are candidates political candidates that are raising enormous amounts of money to decry the religious right so that they can campaign against it even more. And, and if you stand on the word of God and the principles of it, you're going to be branded as intolerant. I just was reminded afresh and anew just this week that the atmosphere and the conditions are mounting to the point that there are certain pages and certain verses that if I preach them as God intended, then I am going to be deemed as proclaiming hate speech and will be arrested for it. A Canadian just these days that he's facing right now, the judgment is about to come in and he's facing a two-year potential prison sentence. Do you know why? Because he was passing out pamphlets at an LGBT parade two years ago telling them that they have to be protective in, in their sexual encounters and then giving them what the Word of God said about their lifestyle. And now he's facing a two-year prison sentence for hate speech. You say, well, preacher, that's in Canada. Well, Time Magazine, Time Magazine just published an article and the name and the title of the article is Regular Christians No Longer Welcome in American Culture. You say, you sure are being an alarmist here today. Well, call it what you will, but just understand that the fleas do come with the dog. While we are not surprised by all of this, we are to be ready. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that everyone who desires to live godly, notice the next two words, will be persecuted. Didn't say might be persecuted, potentially be persecuted. He says will be persecuted. I don't know how much time we have, but it's quickly being curtailed as never before. In April of this year, 
the state of California overwhelmingly by a vote of 52 to 18 passed a law that says that it is now illegal for an evangelical to cancel someone who is in an alternate lifestyle with the word of God. It's illegal and you say, well, that's in California. That, that's the land of the fruit and the nuts. That's not here in North Carolina. Well, 10 miles down the road, 10 miles down the road, the government said to a local fellowship of believers, well, we have zoned this building for a library. We've zoned it for a museum. It's not zoned for you as a 501c3 to have a church. It's here, folks. It's not coming. It's here. It may mean the loss of a job. There have been families right now in our fellowship that have lost their job because they were instructed to do something that went against the teachings of the word of God and they refused to do it and it cost them their job. It may cost you your family. Ultimately, it may cost you your life. What are you going to say and what are you going to do? And we go right back to the question of the hour. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And yet don't do what I've told you to do. This is a really an old adage question. But if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I don't know who wrote this, but I like it. Jesus, my cross, I've taken. All to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken. Thou from hence my all shall be. Perish every fond ambition. All I've sought or hoped or known. Yet how rich is my condition. God in heaven are still my own. Jesus said, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. He said, if you don't love me with a superior ambition, if you don't love me with a greater love and affection than your family, you can't be my disciple. If the time were to come, and I don't know that this is ever going to happen, but if the time were to ever happen with your family backed up against the wall in front of a firing squad and you were commanded, recant your faith, turn from your faith, and we will save your family's lives, what would you do? And if you yourself were against that wall and the guns were pointed at you and you were commanded to recant your faith, what would you do? Little by little, we have watched our country acquiesce, fold, and give in. We have the choice, more now than ever before, to do the same thing, or we can be like John and Peter. And we can say, I can't help but testify of that which I have seen and that which I have heard. Our choice. Francis Schaeffer in a book written 25, 30 years ago, he said one day America is going to wake up and realize that we are living in a country that we don't even recognize. I believe it's here now or it's shortly to come. What, what, what will you do when that moment of conviction is there? These first century Christians like Peter and John and Paul, they took for granted that discipleship entailed going against the culture, the grain of the culture. 21st century Christianity, we face the same similar situation. The, the Constitution, listen, the Constitution is neither absolute nor is it infallible and there is no biblical guarantee whatsoever that our freedoms will always be maintained. 
under the circumstances. Faithfulness to Christ can only mean one thing. And that is that we have to keep on keeping on no matter what the cost. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. If the Lord is leading you to come and find a place to pray for our nation, I would encourage you to come and just either stand here or kneel, whatever God leads you to do. If you're here this morning and you're desiring a place of worship and service, you want to make First Baptist Church your home church, I, I invite you to come and join with us here as we stand together for God's Word. If you're here this morning and you uh, just don't know Jesus as your Savior, and today you're willing to turn away from sin and place your faith in Him, I invite you to come and let me pray with you before you go home today. Father, in the sweet name of Jesus, we submit this invitation time to you. Get glory now in that time which remains. I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.